Greetings and salutations, my fellow misinterpreted flying fish fetuses. It is I, Eric J. Chucky, joined as always by the boy. Hey! This is the Two Nerds Podcast, and today we're talking that Dune. Yeah! Uh, so, short, very brief thing first. There's a spiel we need to do. Well, uh, um, you know what, actually, let's just... This might be the process going forward, because this is the first movie we've done in a long time where a spoiler-free review has merit. Because this is the first movie we watched in a long time on opening fucking weekend. That's fair. Do you want to get the spoiler free review out first? Yeah. Um, I thought this was an incredibly well done, beautiful, atmospheric movie that was as dry as its title implies. I can't disagree with any of that. It is a much more faithful adaptation uh, than the previous versions of Dune that have been made cinematically, as far as I'm aware. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, uh, as as he so aptly put, it is very good, very beautiful, and boy howdy do you feel every minute of its runtime. <laughs> um, that being said, uh, the like button. The subscribe button. The comment section. Doing that and the like button is better than just doing one or the other. Uh, I stream on Twitch. It's twitch.tv forward slash... White Raven? That's right. Pretty sure. If you have Twitch Prime, you could go there. Drop the Twitch Prime on White Raven. Costs you nothing. Gives him a little bit of scratch. That's nice. Sure does. I appreciate the scratch and the support in any uh, way you manage to show it. Including buying my books, which are all linked in the description. One is newer than the others. It came out just in October. If you haven't read the sixth book yet, Colt Regan, All Flesh, check that shit out. If you haven't read any of them yet, come on, man. What the fuck? Start with five. It's a good jumping on point. Yeah, five is a great jumping on point. Um, Three's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Just hasn't changed. Uh, the Patreon is the other thing. Uh, if you want to be cool like Rob and a guy from Ohio, you could sub to the Patreon. I'm not asking for your life savings. <laughs> Buy me one coffee a month. I just don't have a coffee because... Uh, uh, the, the coffee website is spelled like Kofi Kingston. But it, the intent is to give somebody enough money to buy a coffee. So I say coffee. Oh, I I literally was pronouncing that Kofi because I assumed it couldn't be Kofi. <laughs> maybe. Maybe it's Kofi. I don't fucking know. Who, anyway, the hell, who the hell cares? We're talking about Dune. We are talking about Dune. Now, allow me to illustrate a difference between myself and my mechanical compatriot here. Beep boop. Uh... <laughs> You are my counterpart, R2-D2, in the, in the end of things, aren't you? Uh, <laughs> um, <coughs> I watched this Dune movie uh, after having seen some video essays about Dune, the original movie, and then I watched the original Dune movie. You have seen this Dune movie. I did not watch the original Dune movie because I've seen bits and pieces of the original Dune movie and looked at it and said, oh, that's probably fucking garbage. I don't want to watch that. Despite it being given really unfairly glowing reviews by so many internet personalities. I always looked at them, looked at the clips and went, no, that looks like hot garbage. Why would you, why would you, I'm not going to risk it. So I didn't risk it. <laughs> I... I, I just took their word for it, I guess, and here we are. Uh... <sighs> uh, it should be noted, neither of us have ever read Dune. No. I have I... had several Dune fans explain Dune to me. I have had that. I have looked up the plot of Dune some, t some many years ago to steal from it for D&D. &D. And uh, I have the pop cultural osmosis of understanding of Dune that comes from being in nerd circles my whole life. I have tried on two separate occasions to read Dune. I cannot get through fucking Dune. <laughs> um, I read a lot of What Are the Differences articles after I watched the original Dune. So Because I had a lot of questions. I feel like I feel like this is the part of the podcast where you want to talk about the original Dune. Um, you would have that feeling, and, and I understand that feeling, but honestly, I would rather, for the sake of people who are just coming here curious about the original movie... Because there's not a lot to say, one way or the other, let's get into a uh, less spoiler-cautious review of 2021's Dune. Uh, the spoiler-free review holds true. It is 
very long, very beautiful. There's not a bad shot in this movie. There is exactly one shot where it was too dark. We were watching it on HBO Max in our own home. We have a relatively large TV, and we were watching it in the dark so as to provide the best viewing you know, experience, but neither one of us wanted to go to a movie theater on an opening weekend, so you know, we watched it at home. Having seen um, what I believe are stills from the trailer, because here in this house we do not watch movie trailers in general, um, I'll catch some occasionally because I don't care about spoilers because that's all they are. They're just a big wall of spoilers. I, and it, it just gives me enough hints about the exact plot of the movie that <laughs> that I, you can usually call it. And I don't want to do that. Um, exceptions being stuff like Last Night in Soho. I think that looks really good and only because of trailers. But anyway, uh, you're talking about the scene late in the movie where uh, Paul and his mom are crossing the desert, right? Yeah, the very last, very, like, penultimate action scene of the movie. I happened to think it while we were watching it, and then I saw these stills later, and I mean, a lot of this movie is digital. Like, it's 2021, and this is a sci-fi movie, but I did happen to think, what an odd choice in 2021 to go for a day-for-night shot. That's what that was, wasn't it? It, I mean, there exists a daytime version, and it looks a lot better, I don't know the mathematics of it in Thank terms you. of... Thank <laughs> you. I literally was watching it and thought, this looks like bad day for night. What the hell? I mean, it looked like, like decent day for night. It wasn't blue outside. That's fair. <laughs> but it, it was a, a strange choice. I think with like actual nighttime and better underlighting or something... Uh, that would have been phenomenal. And maybe it looks better on the big screen. But, like, notably, in the whole long runtime of this movie, it's not actually that long. It's like two and a half hours. Yeah. But you feel every single fucking second of that. Um, <laughs> that is the only shot that's even remotely criticizable. Everything else is a fucking painting. It's beautiful. Um, uh, the other thing I would criticize about this movie... Um, is some of Rebecca Ferguson's acting. I, I was speaking more of the visuals, but yeah, her she's doing a good job. She's doing an incredibly like believable job oh, as yes. someone who feel it who is she's she's fucking acting her ass off. You believe that is the feeling she is feeling at the time. The problem is someone who is terrified for their son's safety and desperate to keep things from being discovered is going to do weird whisper talking if they have to talk out loud, and she's doing a fun accent, which means her dialogue becomes fucking incomprehensible. It has all the gravitas of what I'm sure they thought Bane was going to sound like, and all of the mush mouth of what Bane did sound like. Uh, this is not... In specific, we're not talking about the implementation of the the voice. Uh, the no, thing. that's cool. That's really well. Yeah, done. that's really well. Done. They do that. They do an amazing job making that feel as scary and terrifying as it's meant to in the series. I understand the the Benny Gesserits in general. I feel are treated so well here because they feel as ominous, foreboding, and mysterious as they should. Yes, they they do a great job with that. No, we're speaking specifically of. Uh, there's this one scene where she's doing the speech that you that if you know nothing from Dune, you probably know this thing from Dune, and you probably don't know it's from Dune. Um, I always forget. <laughs> so, like, she's doing this really iconic speech, which is known, like, by a lot of people who have no idea where it's from, but she's like... And it's so it's fucking incomprehensible. You get about the first two lines... The, the important two lines, the ones people know. But the rest of it just kind of becomes scared mom gibberish. Which and then is occasionally the word fear. <laughs> the great acting. Yeah. Really it's good acting. It's incredibly believable. It's incredibly well acted. And it is fucking incomprehensible. For somebody who wants, who has the say the thing instinct. Oh, come on, man. You said the, the thing thi weird. Say the thing! <laughs> I'm hoping we get it from Paul in the next movie. Yeah. Um, but we're kind of front-loading criticism because there's truthfully... There's not much to criticize about this. I it's mean, that was it. Really fucking good. Yeah, I that's was done. <laughs> that's about it. Of this whole movie, that's what's left. All of the acting is amazing. Like, uh, let's see. I'm not gonna pronounce this right. Uh, I think it's Timothy Chalamet. Yeah, sure. Uh, Kyle Dune, um, Paul and Paul Atreides. He's great. He you. It's really easy to take the kind of character Paul Atreides is. And play him like a shithead. Yeah, he could have really been like an insufferable brat. He could have been about a step above Joffrey and it would have been believable. And he's not. He's, you feel, he's very, like, he feels relatable. He feels 
believable. He feels like a child of privilege, certainly, but one who's trying to to do to fulfill the destiny he he sees for himself, as it were. Yeah. Um, Rebecca Ferguson, as we mentioned, does an amazing job. Uh, just entirely believable. Oscar Isaac is a champion in this fucking movie. Uh, so much so that even though I knew what was going to happen, I was still fucking really sad when it happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, I mean, Jason Momoa's in this, and he's playing a Jason Momoa type. <laughs> he does a good job. He does the great job he always does. It's the it's the kind of character he excels at. Um, I can't think of a single person in this cast who didn't do well. No, and there's so many big names. Like, every time someone new showed up and I was like, I know who that, what, why are you here? <laughs> like, Stellan Skarsgård, Josh Brolin, All randomly right. as like a third, third tier character. He's, uh, he's playing the character that, um, Patrick Stewart was accidentally cast for in the first movie. Ha! Um, but I... That's not a joke. That's amazing. Um, he thought he was hiring a different Patrick Stewart. <laughs> that's fucking astoundingly good. Um, the plot is Dune. The first half of Dune, yeah, as I understand it. That was kind of a ballsy move. Yeah, if you only, if you don't know you're going to get a sequel, and they didn't when they made it, that is... You don't get the whole thing. You get just the tip. you got to pay me more yeah, for the rest. It's really... <laughs> I mean, like, you know, when you've got what you've got, and they made a spectacular film with this, with the money they had and with the, the material, they, the source material they had to draw from, I think they did a fantastic implementation of it. Um, but still, ending it on a, okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, you could have easily had about 45 minutes less lingering shots of sand and put in the rest of the movie, but... I respect your desire to not do that. Well, so here's the <laughs> thing. Now's the time. Um, the the original Dune movie, the original cut of the Dune movie, the one you can find on HBO Max, is two hours and like twelve minutes long. So it's less. It's less than this movie's runtime. Yes, by about thirty minutes. Yes. So is it just the lingering shots of shots of sand they cut? Or? No. <laughs> I, and I understand. Look, okay, first of all, I appreciate David Lynch. Even David Lynch says this was a mistake. You don't, this hire, movie, you don't hire David Lynch for this movie. I think you could have hired David Lynch, but I, no. somehow they grabbed him at his most David self-indulgent Lynch. and cocksure. No. Like, otherwise David Lynch is doing wonderful, weird, world-building stuff. But he wasn't here, except for the weird fetus fish. See, for me, David Lynch, he's too kooky for this movie. This movie needed to have like a certain air of of monolithic, fucking brutalist gravitas to it. And like, I, that this delivers. I agree with that, but I can see why they hired him, especially if you're making Paul's dreams a fixture point. Because they're way toned down in this. Which is good, because there was all, already way too much of that. Yeah. I'm gonna be honest. Like, I know it's an important part of the whole thing. Of the plot of Dune. Of the world building of Dune. It's a very beloved. Boy, howdy, was I fucking tired of that dream sequence by like ten minutes in. I they... can't criticize it because it's incredibly well done and very important to the plot. And it's where it's supposed to be. I personally was tired of it by like the second time. I appreciate that they kept shuffling around what appeared in the dreams. Uh, for two reasons. One, you know, so I didn't get too tired of it. Two... Because um, his dreams kind of change as his future changes before him. Yeah, the future is not set. Yeah, uh, so many things change uh, about his dreams. Notably, one of one of the big things that I misunderstood upon watching the movie the first time, uh, I looked back at and read the summary and realized uh, this is a spoiler. The very last person that Paul fights in the movie is in his dream sequences earlier in the movie as like a mentor and friend, and that's not how that goes in real life. <laughs> That's cool. Which which is part of probably why he doesn't want to kill him. Because he saw that alternate future where that's yeah. not what happens here. Very cool. Um, and, of course, you want to get, you know, your runtime for Zendaya on screen. You know, cause, as in so not... much as she's in this movie. Well, and let me, let me say something here as well as compared to the original Dune. He had a couple of dream sequences and they were trippy. But by the time um, her character shows up in the original movie... 
even though I had earlier that night watched Dune 2021, I am looking at that woman appearing from behind the rock and going, and who the fuck are you? <laughs> they didn't do a good job of that, did they? Well, Paul explains to me, he goes, oh, the woman from my dreams, in his weird inside voice that they all use. Oh, oh. Yes. Oh, so David Lynch is terrible at adapting books. No, that was a director, uh, a studio mandate. They didn't want to do the, the hand signs and all that stuff, the different languages, so they just have thinky voices that sometimes the other people can also hear. So the studio fucked up this adaptation oh, of a yeah. book. Yeah, uh, I don't know that David Lynch's was going to be great because, I mean, let's be fair, his uh, Baron Harkonnen, uh, or Harkonnen as they are now, um, was worse. Was a giddy, laughing, screaming, maniacal, child molesting, flying gas ball man. Whereas Stellan Skarsgård's is a powerful, evil Sith Lord who you should be fucking scared of yeah and <laughs> like i i think they did a wonderful thing with his fake out death scene in the new movie where he gets hit by the gas and flies up to the ceiling and is hiding like a like a fucking monster from wreck and you don't exactly see what kind of shape he's in right you don't see him until he gets out of his mud bath but uh Whereas in, in the original movie, he, like, backs away before the poison even comes out, and then, like, is sitting in the hallway later, and a dude walks up to him, and he's like, am I alive? And the dude's like, yeah, Baron, you're alive. And he's like, yeah, I'm alive! I'm alive! Yeah! It's the dumbest fucking shit. So he's a Muppet? <laughs> dude, like, Saturday morning cartoon villain. Except for all the molesting. Okay, well, that's a choice. <laughs> That was in the book. The molesting was in the book. No, not, I meant the, the everything you just said. Sure. Look, fucking Baron Vladimir Hakonin being a child molester. Yes, that is exactly the sort of shit that <laughs> that Frank Herbert writes. Yes, they, that, that completely tracks. They, they downplayed that a lot in the new movies. So. And I'm happy. Yeah, it's it's a subplot. He's already evil enough. You don't need to add that to him. You, he doesn't need... You don't... Not everyone needs to be maximally evil. Yes. <laughs> there are some puppies that can go unkicked. It's, it's something that we learn as writers as we grow. That maybe a person can have ambiguous, uh, you know, designs and, and, a, and a, a plot, a, a drive that goes against what the heroes want without having to tack a neat little hat on them about how they, you know, eat kittens live. <laughs> Sometimes you do need a kitten eater. Sometimes, yes. But, like, you don't always. No. And, and I, I, I think... don't feel like, I feel like it's, in the book or not, um, it is cruft that could be carved it from is. the character while yeah. losing nothing. Yeah. He he comes across as, as a kingpin-like figure who floats ominously. Yeah, exactly. Not Not a bouncy ball man. What diddles kids. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, I, I don't, like, I can see why in the 80s somebody would be like, how fun or how cool, but I... I, I, see, that's the thing is, I, I haven't watched the movie, and to be clear, won't be doing so. Don't. Um, but I've never gotten it. I've never gotten why so many internet personalities whose opinions on things I find otherwise fairly cromulent are fucking are caping for this god awful like, movie. Well, not, again, not this movie, the the previous 1984 version. Dune. This Dune is really fucking good. <laughs> I I can see someone going it wasn't for me, it was really slow. Fair. Yeah, no, it is very slow. Um It is not in a fucking It is so not in a hurry. It literally only shows you half of the book. <laughs> well, I mean, I think there's there's more to it than that even, but because <clears throat> as I was getting to uh, a lot of the, the the film is framed through narration, which is something that happens in the book as well. You know, yeah. give points where points are due for adhering to the source material. Uh, there is, however, an added scene in the opening, the first real of the scene 80s. of the 80s one, yeah, um, where uh, a misinterpreted fish fetus monster man, uh, who is intended to be from the, the Guild of uh, Navigators, is that what they're called? Yeah, the Guild of Navigators. Um... Who goes to the Emperor, who, mind you, is not in 2021 Dune. He is left to be an ominous... Much better choice. Yeah. Uh, and he says, hey, I need you to kill Paul Atreides. And the Emperor's like, oh, you mean Leto Atreides? And he's like, no, 
I mean Paul Atreides. I need you to set up this situation where they have to take over Dune, and uh, that pisses off the Harkonnens, and there's a war, and their entire family is killed in an ambush attack that you set up by sending them all of these other special soldiers, and... Um, so kill some, Paul Atreides. So someone literally, like, this is, they add an extra scene where someone does, like, an actual version of the shitty, nitpicky cinema sins. What was his plan? And then they outline the entire plot of the movie as if that was literally his step-by-step -step plan. They actually do that? They outline in the entirety of Dune 2021 and, you know, half of the other movie, half of the 84 movie, in the opening scene. That's bad filmmaking. That's terrible fucking <laughs> filmmaking. We get about 45-ish minutes into this movie, maybe maybe an hour and a half, and then there is a scene in which, and I am paraphrasing violently here, but they say, two years later, Paul and this lady are in love, and they are deeply and fondly in love, and he has trained this military to be really good, and these guys are friends now, and they have done many things to destabilize the Harkonnen base, and... We are we running short on runtime. Here is the here is the, all of the parts of the movie we couldn't film. Moving right along. The studio made us clip down this four-hour movie into a two-hour, 14-minute movie, and that's how that works. Yeah. Uh, it's just bad. It's... Terrible. You get um, an amazing character actor to to do the role that uh, what the hell's his name? Which guy? Uh, Javier Bardem has done uh, Silgar or Stilgar, excuse me. Um, what a cool character, a mentor character, an anchor point for Paul to fixate around in the new culture, and he has more scene time. In Dune 2021, a story in which he is his, his major plot uh, involvement isn't introduced until the last 15 minutes than he does in the entirety of 1984. <laughs> I okay. <laughs> I, I just like there's there's so much of this that there's so much of, of 1984 Dune that is just Sting standing near things and going, I hate the Atreides. Okay. Like, I cannot... There's so much wasted celluloid. <laughs> what about this movie that we're here to talk about? <laughs> right, right. I, I, I just I needed to get it off my chest. And I, I felt like the audience, the, the listener, if you haven't seen Dune 1984, again, don't. Uh, I say this as a massive fan of Kyle MacLachlan. Don't. His acting is fine. He a lot does of, a good job. A lot of the actors are doing a fine job. It's just a mess of a movie. And this movie is not that. If you've seen Dune 1984 or not, Dune 2021 is way, way better. Like, not quite Justice League, Justice League, but more similar than you might think. <laughs> um, so, Dune 2021... I feel like we've been talking a lot about what it isn't. Yes. What, uh, what's good about this movie? I I like the shields. I that was one of the things. Even just watching, you know, the new Dune, having no real frame of reference, I thought was really cool. First of all, you get to keep your PG thirteen rating. You've got this really simple blue mist, red didn't coding system. For these like skin tight wiggly shield thingies that allows you to show when a hit is going when a hit is going on and you don't have to show a bunch of gore and you don't have to shaky cam the fuck out of your screen oh, which is so nice like these it's so fights, nice to be able to see what the fuck is happening these fights are so well choreographed and so beautiful and there's so many cool moments of these space soldiers who fight in melee for some reason uh, and it's that's all established like yeah. in the books it's the, the shields make it so that ballistic guns are essentially useless. Oh, yeah, and they pretty much clarify that in the beginning of the yeah, movie. Yeah, where, where they have a nice scene where Paul is is training with Josh Brolin, uh, Gurney, and he he they make it really clear that you have you can't you can't shoot somebody because you have to go a certain you if you go too fast the shield will stop it. You have to go slow enough to penetrate the shield. That's that's great world building. It's a great way for them to work that good world building into the series. Uh, into this into the movie it also is really useful later because you see them training with these shields and fighting with these shields and then they establish that when you're out on dune uh 
you can't use them because they vibrate, which provokes the worm. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, I like it visually. Like, it's just such good shorthand. You introduce that quick and early, and and it looks nice. It's a cool effect. And it goes, it's, it's not orange and blue, or pink and blue, as I might prefer, and a lot of stuff leaning more toward the, uh, the 1980s aesthetic has, has been going. Um, it's a nice crisp red and blue. Red clearly bringing that danger motion. Uh, the, the hallway fight with Duncan Idaho. Every time he flashed too red, I was like, oh no. Like I had that reaction in the back yeah. of my head, knowing full well what happens. I, I was just like, oh, oh no. And it was good. It yeah. felt good. It's... And that's that's the that's really the story of the 2021 Dune. That's that's why it's so much easier to talk about the shitty 1980s version, because this is a really good movie, and a lot of what it does well is kind of hard to to describe why. It's just really well done. Like like these shields, they they work. Yeah. They just fundamentally in your hind brain work. They tell the story visually, they don't overstay their welcome, they don't draw too much attention, and they allow you to clue in what's happening really easily. All of the various lingering shots of the desert, so much as I fucking mock them, are really important. They do world building and tone. Yes. All of the design of the ships, of the technology, is very, like, of, it makes sense given when Dune was written, and it fits the world. It's monolithic. It's brutalist. It's big, chunky sci-fi that looks that fits the world in which it lives, where humanity's ability to traverse the stars isn't really on them. It's not something that they developed. It's something they stumbled upon when they stumbled upon Spice. Um, if I can talk a bit more about, uh, this movie and its place within the zeitgeist. Of course! Um, I, I find this to be an interesting... <sighs> like, two funnels put together. Okay. Uh, or a, or a finger trap, if you will. All right, I'm listening. Um, at the beginning, I mean, obviously there's plenty of other fiction before Dune, but let's use Dune as our, as our origin point here. At the beginning is Dune, which in turn inspired Star Wars and so much other fiction. Yeah, and, and anyone who's ever... Like, watching this, you could, if you don't know, you could easily be, you could easily think that this ripped off a bunch of stuff from Star Wars, when in actuality it is the exact reverse. <laughs> well, and, and we balloon out into all kinds of fiction and then come back into this dune at a point where a lot of those kinds of fiction are dead or dying or uh, have been isolated to their niches. You have such delightful stuff of... Um, uh, big guilds, big houses, big entities that you can ascribe your allegiance toward as a fan. Yeah. Um, it's, as you, I believe, very succinctly put it, Space Game of Thrones. It really is. It's, uh, with a lot of the humor pulled out, Game of Thrones, upon reflection, was a pretty funny TV series. They they were trying to keep it light. Yeah. Because they had some dark material to go off of. Because they had someone who was trying for the same tone as this... And is a much worse writer. So, <laughs> um, but you have that that post apocalyptic teen fiction style in there, which again is is has been fading out of the pop culture. But mm -hmm. look, Paul Atreides is a YA protagonist. He is. He is being a lady from being the perfect YA protagonist. He also doesn't use a bow. That's uh. fair. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, he does it well. I, I have been on record several times in various pieces of material that we put out that I have kind of gravitated pretty far away from the coming of age story. The boy hero's journey. I don't care. You don't, you're not a guy who likes the Joseph Campbell narrative. You, you tend to shy away from it where you find it. It's just at this point in my life, I'm looking for other shit. Um, this movie does it well. Now, don't get me wrong. It took three quarters of the movie for Paul Atreides to get my buy-in. But he got it. But he did get it. I believe in him, and I hope for him, and I want to see him succeed. And as dry as the movie was, I'm really looking forward to the next part. And once the action does pick up in this film, it gets very... It's easy to be invested in it. Yeah. Because they give you time, and that's part of the reason it is so slow. Because you, you get enough time with Leto Atreides... To really mourn him. Yes. When when the inevitable happens. You get enough time with all of Paul's support network, except for his mother, that you end up really feeling a bad way 
when the Harkonnens fuck their shit up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so much so that you don't you don't know Duncan Idaho for that long in this, as I understand it. Uh, having seen bits and pieces again through pop culture and having had people explain Dune to me on several occasions, you get a lot more of Duncan Idaho in the books. But in this movie, you don't get a wealth of Duncan Idaho. But then when he when he eventually does his glorious, wonderful, heroic sacrifice, like it it tugs on the heartstrings. You feel that moment. That is testament to some very powerful and well done filmmaking. I have to say as well that it has emotional core and it has these characters that feel like they're having uh, genuine reactions. I don't want to say realistic because that everybody reacts differently. But without, genuine. without the melodrama. It doesn't feel artificial. Because there's no Luke screaming after Obi-Wan. But oh, that is an important thing. These are regular humans, not Star Wars humans. They, they react like people would. Yes. Uh, <laughs> there are those... I love that everyone hugs. That was something I said. We took a... HBO fucked up, so we had to take a brief break for the movie. But I really liked that everyone in the Atreides family and close to them hugs. It it's it's a really great way to show them as not being a staid, reserved, noble house where there's not much intimacy. No, they're a family. They love each other. Yeah. <laughs> Even despite the fact that they are very severe people, they still there is that affection there is that affection yeah and that that bond that runs between all of them and just even the way that a lot of the the supporting characters from the atreides house look at each other and talk to each other it's not overstated there's no screaming there's no wildness honestly the only person who has that depth of raw emotion uh in the first half of the film is lady jessica when paul has got his hand in the box and she's Desperately afraid that her son is about to die. <laughs> her special magical son that she should not have made, but chose to and had some power in doing so. And really hopes is the secret messiah that her order has been struggling for for a long ass time. They're not specific. <laughs> so that it's not just her son, it's all of her. It's her life's work is all on the line. And the thing holding it on the line is... This teenager's ability to take crippling pain like an absolute chad. Uh, yeah. I, I... I know... I can't imagine myself sitting down to watch this again anytime soon. I will not be watching this again. I, I, I cannot <laughs> fathom. But, um... I really enjoyed the time I spent with it. And the more I analyze it, the more I find small things that I really love. If it were a bit more fun. If it did take a little time to get, or a little less time, excuse me, to get to the action. Maybe if we had more Duncan Idaho, who is, of all of the characters in the movie, the loosest. The one who's the most <laughs> He's jovial. having a good time. He's having a pretty good time. He's the only one who makes jokes. Uh, no, there's, uh, there's a couple other guys. Some of the Fremen. That's true. Yeah. The Fremen makes some jokes, and, and Duncan Idaho makes jokes. And once he's dead, there are no more jokes in the movie. <laughs> With him goes the jokes. <laughs> and that's fine. This is, I would say above anything, this movie is a drama. You know what? Zendaya also makes jokes. And yeah. I like that. She came back, she came in, and the jokes were back. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if it were a little bit more that, I could see myself watching this a couple times. As it stands... It's, it's just a little too dry, but it is so well done that I would definitely recommend you put your time into it. Yeah, it is just very good. Uh, I think we're good. Um, I, I believe maybe there will be a second part of this podcast in the future, and maybe a third if we're all very lucky. Fingers crossed. Everything's better when nerds talk about it. Fuck it!